So what happened on the set of City of Lies? We're going to talk about this new lawsuit that, well, it's not new. It's been out for a bit. The trial is going to take place next month, the end of July. And it happened on a set of City of Lies, a film that Johnny Depp was in uh, back in 2017. So City of Lies was previously called Labyrinth, as in L.A., LA's capitalized Brent. It's like a play on names. It's like Los Angeles Labyrinth type of thing. But they changed the name to City of Lies. Uh, it stars uh, Johnny Depp as a cop and Forrest Whitaker, who is the journalist. Two of them team up to try to solve the murders of Biggie Smalls and Tupac in LA. And they sort of kind of unravel the corruption of LA police during that time. The cool thing was they were able to get Biggie's mom on the set and she was able to play herself in the movie. Her name is Valletta Wallace. So I thought it was pretty awesome. Uh, Brad Furman is the director. He is known for directing the movie The Infiltrator, a Zendaya Neverland music video, Justin Bieber, What Do You Mean music video, and The Lincoln Lawyer uh, with Matthew McConaughey and some other movies as well. Uh, we also have Miriam Siegel, who is the founder and producer of Good Films. Uh, it is an indie production company that she's a producer of, and she's also a founder as well. Uh, she also did The Infiltrator, a movie with Brad Furman. Now, on June 6, 2018, uh, Greg Rocky Brooks fought a lawsuit against Johnny Depp, Miriam Siegel, Brad Furman, Good Films Production, Infinitum Nihil, which is uh, Johnny Depp's production company, also run by his sister, Chrissy Dembrowski. Now, it does cite physical, emotional, psychological injury. Uh, it's asking for an award of general and punitive damages in addition to the fees that the trial is going to accrue. Uh, this took place in downtown L.A., um, outside and inside of Hotel Barclays, where they were doing the filming during this time. And Rocky Brooks is the location manager. Now, a location manager, what they do, they procure the permit for filming. And um, in his case, he's going to liaise with Film L.A. just to make sure that, you know, if he were if they were to get a permit to film for X amount of time, uh, he has to make sure that it wraps up by then. Otherwise, you know, I'm sure there's going to be some some nasty fines. Uh, anyway, so just to go on with uh, what happened that day. So Miriam Siegel, the producer, she realizes that they need more time to film. So she goes to Rocky and the Rocky goes to Jason Garnett, uh, who is working with Film LA. And they were actually able to grant an extension so this is the first extension. Later on, uh, Miriam Siegel realizes, you know what? That extension, it's not going to cut it. We actually need a little bit more time. So Miriam Siegel goes to Rocky. Rocky goes to Jason Garnett. And then he talks to Film LA. And they were able to get a second extension. Now, this second extension allows them to film outside of Hotel Barclay till 11 p.m. But for the inside, they're able to film until 12 a.m. So those are the deadlines where they have to wrap things up by. So at 10.50, this is about 10 minutes right before uh, the extension ends for the filming of Outside of Hotel Barclay. Uh, Jason Garnett runs up to Rocky and is like, hey, you know, you guys got like 10 minutes. You need to wrap up like right now. So Rocky goes and tells the first uh, AD, which is assistant director, Paul Silver, that time is running out. And at this point, Furman, who is the director, he yells and he says, well, why didn't you go tell that to Johnny Depp? And so, you know, Rocky was a little bit confused because Johnny Depp was he wasn't the director. Um, but, you know, he had no choice. It was like, OK, I guess. But, you know, he felt that quoting uh, knowing Depp may become upset and feeling the need to protect himself, which I thought was kind of odd that he thought that he needed to protect himself from Johnny Depp just by telling him of this news. So he tries to approach uh, an LAPD officer that was on set. His name was Jim Big Rig to get his assistance. But he says that before he was able to get to Big Rig, uh, Johnny Depp came out of nowhere and became uh, started accosting him, attacking, angrily screaming. Uh, Johnny Depp says along the lines of, who the F are you? You have no right to tell me what to do. Rocky also says that Johnny Depp was reeking of alcohol. Rocky maintains that he was calm. You know, he explained who he was. He was like, hey, I'm the dude that does the permits for the location. And the extension only holds up till 11 p.m. He says that Johnny replied, I don't give a F who you are and you can't tell me what to do. And apparently during this time, punched Rocky twice in the ribs. Uh, again, Rocky says he didn't react. And Johnny replies, I will give you 100K to punch me in the face right now. 
And Rocky says again, he didn't react to that as well. At this point, he says Johnny Depp is screaming and berating him until bodyguards had to physically remove Johnny Depp from the scene. He believes that Johnny Depp was drinking and using drugs throughout the day on the set. Now, this is kind of a, you know, interesting uh, interaction. When I first read it, I was just like, okay, like, I, I guess, like, you know, with like, in terms of like, whether or not this could be probable, because, you know, I don't know Johnny Depp. I don't know any of these people, but it's like, okay, this guy needed to get like a permit and then like they wanted to film and then like, I don't know, maybe filming was really stressful and everyone was stressed on the set. And I don't know, it, it sounded kind of interesting, but you know, to me, I thought it was weird that Johnny Depp would just kind of keep escalating if the guy wasn't reacting back. You know, he said he wasn't reacting back. He said he was calm the entire time. April of 16th, now this is a couple days after this has happened. Uh, Rocky says he went back to work and Miriam Siegel, the producer, said that she wanted him to sign a declaration letter uh, this declaration letter probably says like, hey, you know, I'm not going to sue for what happened on set. This happened and I want you to sign this and not talk about it. Possibly, right? That's just me speculating. Now, of course, Rocky says that he refused. And upon that refuse, uh, he was terminated right afterwards. So that is from the perspective of Rocky Brooks. Johnny Depp, on the other hand, tells a completely different story. So Johnny Depp maintained that, you know, Miriam Siegel, you know, she did have some conflict with other people on the set. Uh, he talks about how Brad Furman, the director, he was stressed with the budget because apparently they were over budget. Now, he did say that he was able to, you know, get a last minute favor from his rap star friend named Killer Mike, who flew in from Atlanta with like a three hours notice. And he did us a favor for Johnny Depp. He was coming in to film. Biggie's mom, Valletta Wallace, was on the set as well. And the character's widow. Johnny Depp plays as a detective. And this is based on real life events. They were able to get the detective's widow and his kids to actually be on that set that day. So to Johnny, Johnny was like, well, everything needs to be perfect because we got a lot of big people coming in and I don't want there to be any hiccups. Uh, Johnny says that he thought that they had until midnight to shoot. Uh, he says that he thinks Brad told him this. He wasn't sure, but he's pretty sure it was Brad Furman that told him this. Uh, Brad is the director again. And he says the first encounter that he had with Rocky, uh, it had nothing to do with hours or even pressures. He said that he noticed Rocky was like stomping around, you know, the set. Uh, he seemed he seemed a little bit ticked at the time. Uh, he saw that Rocky talked to Brad. He didn't know what actually was going on between the two of them, didn't know what they were talking about. And he was sitting there at the monitors with the, uh, the script, the person who's in charge of the script. And her name is Emma. Um, Emma's gonna be important uh, later on, not in the story, but in a different video, I guess. He said that Rocky seemed to be behaving irrational and was sort of of an angry manner. That's the quotes right there. There was an elderly black woman in his way. Um, he believed her to be a homeless extra, although he wasn't sure, but he was pretty sure that she was homeless. He said that during that day, he had talked to quite a few homeless people in downtown LA, and he can't really call if she was one of them or not. In downtown LA, there is a lot of homeless people, so it is possible that he could have been talking to homeless people that day. Um, so he says that Rocky was basically stomping around, almost uh, as if he turned around and just walked into her. But then he told her to just get the F out of my way type, you know? He said it was disrespectful to her and use harsh words. He called Rocky belligerent. He called Rocky out with a cocky attitude. Uh, he got in between Rocky and Rocky had kind of had this, you know, attitude where it was like, F you, I don't have to listen to you type of attitude. And so JD says, this is in quotes, and you know, JD's just bringing this out of memory. So JD says that, listen, if you're gonna insult, dress down, belittle, if you're gonna treat other in this way, we're not gonna make it, that doesn't happen. This behavior towards women is unacceptable. This does not happen on set, I don't wanna see it again. And he says, you know, from his recollection, he remembers Rocky kind of just standing there chewing gum and being cocky, you know? And in reality though, they didn't have time to argue, they just had to shoot. So JD turned around and checked to see if the woman was all right. He asked her, are you okay? Do you need anything? He said that she was okay, she said she was cool, but you know, he could tell that she seemed freaked out. Now. At this point, you know, JD walks back and he says that Rocky, <laughs> I'm just gonna read this quote, but I didn't even look into it. So I don't really know what the reference mean. I might look it up later. But he said Rocky was 
sort of a tough guy, a Leo Gorsi New York gumshoeing kind of thing, mumbling, still behaving somewhat goofy. Now, during his deposition video, uh, they did ask, you know, why didn't you remove Rocky from the set? Wasn't this ground to remove Rocky? And JD was like, JD says he didn't hold a grudge. You know, it was it was time crunch and they just needed to just move on instead of just kind of dealing with the situation. He did remember though, that Rocky was a little bit frantic as well, uh, especially about the location, but he didn't really understand what. Now JD did reiterate that this was the last thing he wanted to happen on set. He did not want others to see an extra be dressed down for no reason or treated as scum. Biggie's mom was there, Valletta, and then also uh, the character's widow and the character's actual children were there as well. So he didn't want them to see like any of this stuff. He said the interaction lasted maybe like 30 to 40 seconds. Now, according to JD, he said that he talked to Furman, uh, which is the director after the rap. Furman told him about the discussion with Rocky earlier. And then JD, you know, after talking to the director, he was like, oh, okay, I guess I kind of understand now because, you know, Rocky was really freaked out about the uh, the time management and how they had to get out of the location before the, uh, the permit expired. And, you know, JD just didn't want the drama to drag out or anything because they still have more to film. They still have like another month or so to film. So he just, you know, wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. He was just like, uh, he said something about, you know, Rocky, he just got a little too hot, made a mistake, and they still need to finish. So JD sent Sean or maybe Jerry, one of the bodyguards, he's not sure which one, to find Rocky because he wanted to just clear the air. He understand that Rocky was probably under pressure and wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt, like I mentioned earlier. And location was his responsibility. JD says that he gets it. So at some point, uh, JD was able to find Rocky and JD apologized, Rocky apologized. And uh, JD did ask his assistant to bring like a bottle of wine uh, that they had opened so they can toast in. He said they might have toasted in like a paper cup. And JD did say that uh, Rocky asked for a selfie. So they took a selfie together. And that was the last time he's heard of Rocky until the lawsuit happened. Now, I just want to go back 15 minutes before this altercation happened. Uh, apparently... 15 minutes before, Rocky sort of had a verbal altercation with a security guard. So let me get into this story really quick. So Richard Wynn uh, represents Gilmore Associates, who owns the empty buildings where they were filming the movie. Now, he owns the empty buildings, but he doesn't own the sidewalks that they were filming on. So the sidewalk right there is considered public property. But uh, Rocky said that, you know, this guy, Richard Wynn, he has a habit of extorting money from productions. And so it's his job to make sure that Wynn doesn't do this to the productions that he's working with. So he said that this Wynn guy had a habit of sending security guards to like videotape and film. And, you know, as like a ha ha, you guys are filming and like we're going to charge this, you know, going to charge you guys for this later, it seems. You know, Rocky, when he was walking away from the security guard, he knew the security guard was filming. He uh, flipped off the security guard. And that was his side of the story. But later on, when they were questioning him, it seems like the other side has another story where Rocky and the security guard actually got in like a verbal altercation and the security guard was filming it. And Jason Gonnett, who was the guy working for LA Film, he saw the interaction. He came up and told Rocky to leave the security guard alone. And so Rocky did as he was told and walked away. So this kind of builds the picture that I think JD's team is going to go with. They're going to say, hey, this guy was already hot-headed with the security team. He was, you know, already under a lot of pressure. So he was looking to beef with anyone, anyone he would come and cross paths with. So this could make the story for JD a little bit more um, believable. Although I could see, you know, Rocky's story happening as well, but not quite as much though, because I don't, I don't think there's been at any witnesses that have come out and said they saw the punch happen and the version that Rocky is telling. But we'll see. We'll see. You know, we obviously don't have access to like all the witnesses or anything. But um, this is all that we have so far in the, uh, the court documents. So from Rocky's point of view, he said that after the altercation with uh, him and JD, he continued to do his job. He cleared the streets. Now, he did agree and say that Johnny Depp at some point did apologize. However, he doesn't remember the wine. He said that he doesn't drink wine, but he did remember the apology. Uh, he did remember that there was a bro handshake that was being exchanged. You know, I, I guess like when you do the bro handshake thing, you like grab hands and you do like the half hug apology thing. And, you know, he did accept the apology at that time. So it seems like everything's all good and everyone's moved on. 
But no, uh, May 7, 2018 is when there was a New York Post article that came out. And this article, here it is right here. So this came out May 7, 2018, over a year ago. I, I wonder how they were able to get this story. Now, after this article came out, uh, July 6, 2018 is when Rocky Brooks filed the lawsuit. Now, the interesting thing that has come out on the, on the internet, and you'll probably find this if you Google Rocky Brooks, Johnny Depp, uh, you'll find a picture uh, of them together. And, you know, I think Rocky Brooks has his arms around Johnny Depp and like they're smiling. So apparently this photo was taken after the altercation and happened the same night. Johnny Depp had mistakenly said it was a selfie, although you can tell it's not a selfie. But Johnny Depp, you know, his version was, you know, he thought that Rocky had asked for the picture right after they hugged it out. However, Rocky's version is later when everything was wrapped up, Johnny Depp was taking pictures with his fans who were like lingering out there. Um, his friend, Miguel, was like, hey, you and him should take a picture together. And he actually went up to Johnny Depp, was like, hey, can you take a picture with Rocky? And Miguel was the one that took a picture of it. So that's Rocky's side of events. So I'll show you guys the picture because you know, you're gonna see it everywhere. <laughs> um, Rocky maintains that like after it happened, he was really stressed about it, but it, you know, things moved on. Um, he was able to still find work and things like that, but you know, it was until the article came out. He said that he was trying to find work uh, through one of his friend, Bertolino, who was gonna be one of the witnesses, by the way. Um, however, Bertolino said that Johnny Depp had blacklisted him. Now, we don't know if there's any credence behind this or not, but that is what Bertolino said, and that is what Rocky had repeated. When he tried to find other work as well, uh, he said that he wasn't able to be hired, and he just assumed that it was because, you know, JD had blacklisted him or something like that. Um, I think the term they used was blackballed, but I'm going to use the word blacklisted because I, I understand that one more. <laughs> Rocky did say that he was able to find work immediately after the incident. Now, there was a time where he didn't work uh, because of a car accident. He was on disability for a little bit. He also said that he had emotional trauma. He went to a family therapist. But a lawyer did point out in 2015 that he went three times after the incident. But he only went when he received interrogatories asking if he received medical treatment. So the lawyer is trying to paint a picture. It was like, hey, like, you know, were you really suffering for emotional damages? Were you really traumatized about this? Anyways, so we have two different version of events. We have Johnny Depp's version. We have Rocky Brooks version. Uh, we will have another version as well. Uh, we'll do a separate video on that. We have someone who comes out. She's a script writer and she's going to give her side and version of the events. Although I wasn't able to find it on any of like the court websites or anything. So I think it was a leak somewhere, but I found it on depth dive and we'll go over that in a uh, separate video. So, you know, nothing too crazy going on here. When I heard about it was a punch, I thought it was like a punch in the face. I thought the guy was bruised up or something, um, but it was actually just a punch to the ribs, which, you know, if that did happen to you in real life, then yeah, that still counts as assault. Um, however, it just wasn't as crazy as I thought. And I don't know, this one is kind of similar to the other case, right? Where at least to my knowledge, it doesn't seem like we have really any witnesses to verify that they saw this happen. Um, and it kind of just goes back to saying, oh, you know, Johnny Depp was on drugs and he was drinking again. So we'll see how this unravels. I am not saying that Rocky Brooks is lying or anything. Uh, we don't have all the evidence and I'm not as opinionated as the other trial that we covered because that trial, we had a lot of stuff that was out uh, because the UK trial had happened right before it. So we're still waiting for more information to come out. But yeah, so far, it's just kind of like, hmm, this is interesting. All right. Well, thanks for watching.